The Department of English at Missouri State University presents Let's Read Paradise Lost, Book 1, Lines 299 to 330. As we discussed in the audio context lectures, uh, Milton imitates classical poetry in beginning his epic In Medias Race, which, by the way, um, does not, strictly speaking, in Latin mean in, middle of th in the middle of things. It means into the middle of things, because it uses the accusative case medias res, not the ablative media re. So it implies position towards, not position in. So he's just like smash cut right in the middle of things. And where does Milton smash cut into? All like basically the dust is still rising on the floor of hell as all of the fallen uh, angels have just basically crashed into the floor of the universe after losing the war in heaven to God and being cast out. And it begins with them sort of flopping around and then and Satan and his number two Beelzebub kind of look at each other and go, man, you look rough. And um, they're all just sort of figuring out what to do. And um, this is at, this is the point at which Satan starts to get himself together a little bit. Um, having been the most eminent angel in heaven, he is still the, has that most exalted nature after the fall. And the passage we're going to look at is his first efforts to rally his troops, so to speak, and make the best of their new situation. Let's, let's have a look. As in the first Let's Re Read video, I'm going to try to call your attention to the main clauses, the active uh, verbs uh, that um, draw forward the story as opposed to the subordinate clauses that um, provide ornament to the structure. Nathalus he so endured, who's he? Satan in this case, till on the beach of that inflamed sea he stood and called his legions angel forms. Okay, he stood, he called his legions angel forms who lay entranced thick as autumnal leaves that strew the brooks in Valambrosa, where the Trurian shades, high overarched, embower, or scattered sedge afloat, when with the fierce winds Orion armed hath vexed the Red Sea coast, whose waves overthrew Bosiris and his Memphian chivalry. While with perfidious hatred they pursued the sojourners of Goshen, who beheld from the safe shore their floating carcasses and broken chariot wheels, so thick bestrewn, abject and lost, lay these, that is, the fallen angels, covering the flood, under amazement of their hideous change. Now I'm going to stop at this point here. This is the end of the first of the uh, two or three sentences in this passage. Most of this passage is marked by another feature of epic we talked about in the overview called the heroic simile. And it's called the heroic simile because it's usually used in heroic poetry and as and as I discussed it often compares uh, historical or biblical and natural imagery with what's going on in very extended similar similes that take place over uh, the, the um, over the course of a number of lines. It is often introduced with an adjective thick and you know the comparative as thick as they lay the angel forms who lay entranced and all of this down to um, so thick, thick as, so thick. This is where it starts, this is where it picks up again, and all of this is the heroic simile, which is sort of developing the idea of just how thick the angels lay strewn at the bottom of the universe on the floor of hell. Thick as autumnal leaves that strew the brooks in Valambrosa, where the Etrurian shades high over arched and bower. So first we get a, pr a pretty scene of, um, you know, le autumn leaves in, in brooks in a forest, or scattered sedge afloat, when with fierce winds Orion armed hath vexed the Red Sea coast. And Orion, you may you may remember, is a constellation that comes out when? 
in the winter, it's usually in, in the winter when we see Orion with his um, bow and his three-starred belt in the sky. And so he's talking about and, uh, the fierce winds of winter storms that that blow the seaweed thick in the shore of the Red Sea coast. Milton had traveled a little bit, remember? And But now Red Sea provides a link to an, another sort of associative poetic link. The Red Sea coast, that same, what's the Red Sea famous for? Whose waves overthrew Busiris, this is another name for uh, Far the pharaoh, uh, and his Memphian sh chivalry. Memphi Memphis being a city in Egypt. Um, this kind of poetry, this cl uh, classicizing poetry like this, often works with chain through chains of association. Um, so you're you're kind of like one step removed from the thing. So you need to kind of uh, bring a lot of knowledge to bear, or at least pay attention to the footnotes in the Broadview anthology. So the Red Sea coast overthrew his chivalry. Right? Who are we talking about? We're talking about the Pharaoh pursuing the um, uh, while with perfidious hatred they pursued. And I love this phrase, the sojourners of Goshen. That is the Israelites who had sojourned or stayed as guests for a while in Egypt before they were turned into slaves. And then they then they were traveling away, which is another word for sojourner. Um, Goshen is, a, I think, a, a place in Judea. And so, again, there's that chain of associations, just like, Go, just like Memphis is Egypt, Goshen is Judea or Israel. The sojourners of Goshen, who beheld... Remember, look, when we get these who, which, uh, when, all of these introduce subordinate clauses. Who beheld from the safe shore their floating carcasses and broken chariot wheels? So thick be strewn, abject and lost, lay these, covering the flood, under amazement of their hideous change. That is, they've been, um, they've been changed by their fall. They are no longer angels. Now, Milton does, uh, packs a lot into this epic simile, and what he does is he packs in associations. Autumn leaves indicate the change of season and the cycles of death that, that are going to be initiated by the fall caused by Satan. Um, the, the idea of the Egyptians getting slain in their pursuit of the Israelites brings into mind the whole concept of sacred history. The idea of um, time as ordained by the providence of God, which we remember from the last video, is what Milton is at pains to justify. And so um, he's making not just an imagistic association, but a moral and a historical association between the defeated troops of Pharaoh and the defeated troops of Satan in hell at the beginning of time. Both are indexes of God's greater power and his ultimate victory in the course of providence. So, while a lot, Milton, even though it seems like he's very wordy, he's, he does a lot in a short space. So thick be strewn, abject and lost lay these covering the flood. Um, most of you won't remember Johnny Car Carson and Ed McMahon when he would do this thing. It was so hot. How hot was it? It was so hot. When you see that and make when that Johnny Carson so thick, that's when you know the, that you are um, or so great or so vast or or so ugly or whatever it was. That's that's when you know your heroic simile is wrapping up. All right, next part. He back to Satan here. Let's get our let's get our main clause highlighter out again. He called out so loud that all the hollow deep of hell resounded. And I, I love Milton is a very remember he's blind, right? Which means he writes in in a way with sound. And there's the, and there's such a there's such wonderful sound effects in this poem that because I mean poetry is made out of sound basically, and and Milton's a great. A uh, sculptor of sound, where you can imagine he called so loud that all the hollow deep of hell resounded. The note how the vowel sounds are long and drawn out and have that hollow howl, howl kind of howling sound. And so here's Satan's first speech in hell after the war to the assembled devils. And the other thing that we remember about um, the uh, um, about epic poems, I'm just gonna Israelites. The other thing that we should remember about epic poems, besides heroic similes that we talked about, and one another feature is that people give long speeches. 
And they give epic speeches, we might say, that are long and highly rhetorical and written in a high style and are um, heroic in a sense. Uh, it, in a lot of classical heroic literature, in Germanic heroic literature, in, in South Asian heroic literature, like the Mahabharata, um, there's this tr traditional association of heroism with three features. And we saw a little of this with reference to Sir Gawain in, in, as well, of thought, word, and deed. These are the three things that that define heroism. You should be you should be great in your thinking. You should be great in your in, you should be a great speaker, and you should be able to do great things. And Satan um, fulfills at least two out of the three of these things. Um, he is, uh, you know, in many ways presented, especially in the first part of the poem, as the point of view character, as the protagonist, as the hero of the epic poem, which, um, you know has been the, the cause of a lot of sort of critical debate over time as to why why Satan uh, is the center of the poem for so much of the uh, text. So here's his first speech. Princes, potentates, warriors. The flower of heaven once yours, now lost. If such astonishment as this can seize eternal spirits, or have ye chosen this place, after the toil of battle, to repose your wearied virtue? For the ease you find, that's a gloss, to slumber here, as in the vales of heaven? Or in this abject posture have ye sworn to adore the conqueror who now beholds Cheriff and Seraph rolling in the flood with scattered arms and ensigns? till anon his swift pursuers from heaven gates discern the advantage, and descending, tread us down, thus drooping, or with linked thunderbolts transfix us to the bottom of this gulf? Awake, arise, or be forever fallen. Satan's good at speechifying, man. Whenever Satan sort of gives a speech, it's, it's, uh, it's like, I mean, uh, apologies to Friday Night Lights fans, but it's like Coach Taylor, you know, it's like, like, clear eyes, full heart, can't lose. Except, of course, it's Satan, and he's talking to demons who betrayed their loyalty to God and are therefore damned eternally. And therefore, the... Uh, ah, crap, sorry, just filled some coffee. Um, uh, that's why that forever fallen at the end there is a little bit ironic. And you're going to find that a lot of what Satan says is ironic. And I don't mean ironic like he's being sarcastic. It's ironic in the sense of situational irony, tragic irony. That is to say that um, he's, he's speaking as if there was a course of action that was possible that would change the outcome for him and for those who follow him, when in fact it's impossible. He says, awake, arise, or be forever fallen. They are forever fallen. Um, he begins with some flattery, right? Princes, potentates, warriors, the flower of heaven once yours, now lost. If such astonishment that is literally being turned to stone, is it possible that astonishment can seize eternal spirits? Can you be frozen? Um, being, can, Are you so great that you can just be like stuck in place like this? Or do you, have you guys decided you just want to have a little nap here? You just want to rest because you worked so hard. He's being, there he's being a little sarcastic. And then he scares them. Or in this abject posture, to be abject is to be thrown down on the ground. Have you given up? Have you sworn to adore the conqueror? Who's that? That's God, who now beholds cherub and seraph. Who's that? That's those who have recently been angels, who, who Satan is still referring to as such, rolling in the flood with scattered arms and ensigns, that is with flags. And if you guys just keep there, lay, if you keep laying there like that, he's basically saying, anon, soon his swift pursuers from heaven gates dis will discern the advantage. They'll see us and descend, descending tread us down, thus drooping or with linked thunderbolts. Um, Satan, from, from this point on, is going to be 
a whirlwind of activity. He's going to um, call a council in hell in book two. He's going to propose a plan where he's going to get, if not victory over God, revenge over God. Because he heard a rumor that God's creating a new race of sentient beings on a place called earth and he so he's going to go and check it out and see what kind of maybe they can you know have their revenge by messing it up for god if 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 they can't beat him at least they can make things less pleasant of course in book uh so book two he's going to propose all this in the council in hell um uh with and we're going to see different demons representing different points of view on what uh, they should do. And there's a lot of speechifying there um, with different demons presenting, uh, representing different vices. And then, and then after book two, we're going to skip from, uh, skip to book nine. Unfortunately, if it was up to me, I would teach a whole, a whole course on Paradise Lost, but uh, I know um, maybe that's a bit of a niche taste on my part. Uh, but well, I'm going to do in, uh, two more videos on Paradise Lost. One is going to be on uh, Passage in Book 2, and then we're going to uh, turn to Book 9. Thank you for listening. Please get in the discussion boards with any thoughts or questions you have on this. See ya!